I grew up in Newark, New Jersey, Detroit, Michigan, and Gary, Indiana. <laughs> All three? All three, yep. Moved around, finished, uh, moved to Gary in high school, graduated Gary Lou Wallace. Lou Wallace? Yep. Yeah. What year? 1968. Ooh, good yeah, year. Yeah. Then uh, went to the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Uh, graduated Madison, uh, came back to the region, uh, worked a couple years, and then went to law school at Valparaiso University. What year did you graduate? Graduated Valpo in 77 and uh, went with uh, Cohen and Theros. Oh, uh, well, the premier. Yeah, uh, whereas, you know, under Max and Nick, I learned a lot about courtroom, yeah. uh, criminal and civil. And then in uh, late 1985, Jim Richmond was appointed U.S. Attorney by President Reagan. And I did not know Jim really well, but I knew him, and he and I had done some few, a few things against each other in private practice, and I, I, I believe Jim would be a good guy to work for them. And I was always very interested in the criminal process primarily, and particularly the federal criminal process. But you started out as a defense attorney. Right, and they, I had done, uh, I had done uh, uh, several federal jury trials as a defense attorney, and I always uh, liked my dealings with the U.S. Attorney's Office, and it just seemed to me an office that I would like to work for, and Jim Richmond, someone I'd like to work for. Did you win or lose against it? Yeah, I, uh, I, it was a great decision on my part. In fact, uh, Jim will tell you this. Uh, I was his first hire. Uh, I was the first person he hired, and uh, he and I argued as to whether or not I would stay three years. I, you know, I said, Jim, boy, I don't know, you know, this is transition. Well, that was 31 years ago. I guess I stayed by three years. Yeah. <laughs> so I went to our South Bend office for six or seven months, uh, did a number of trials over there and just helped out until we started getting some more people on board. Uh, in the South Bend office, including Cliff Johnson, who is now uh, the uh, acting U.S. Attorney, of course. So uh, Jim started from scratch. Right? Uh, Jim, there was a, there were, a f you know, there was a small number of oh, AUSAs, yeah. yeah. But the main thing Jim did with me is he told me I want to focus on public corruption and. Dave, I'm putting you in charge of it. So I, you know, I was still a relatively young attorney, you know, eight, nine years of experience. And, you know, Jim entrusted me with an enormous uh, amount of responsibility. And I always, always appreciated that. And uh, we put a team together of uh, which is still the public corruption team today, primarily the FBI, the IRS, and the uh, uh, state police. I probably started the public corruption in earnest, I'm guessing, Bill, maybe April, May of 86, when I started coming back from the South Bend office and uh, we really, uh, and Jim, of course, was doing a lot of behind the scenes work with the agencies, getting their commitments and their people on board. So when did Rudy Bart come into focus? Uh, I believe Rudy was convicted in late 85 or early 86. I'm, I'm not sure when. He started doing his federal prison time, and then we, it was the U.S. Attorney, 
I'm not sure through who, uh, Jim got the indication that Rudy would like to cooperate, to talk. Well, of course, we were very interested. We're always interested in people that want to talk. As I always said for years, it doesn't hurt us at all to listen. Uh, we may not be interested, but it doesn't hurt us to listen. Well, uh, Rudy uh, Bart indicated that he wanted to talk, so we made arrangements through the marshal service and what have you to bring them back and talk. And uh, that's how it started. Well, did he give an indication as to why he now wanted to cooperate? <clears throat> I, th I think, you know, I, I think that I think part of his uh, reason was he didn't feel that his family was being treated as they should. And uh, he was annoyed about that. And, that and, uh, okay. He, uh, his wife, as I recall, had some sort of job out at the county. He was not happy with how she was being treated. By the like county? That. Correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. So uh, that was part of it, and uh, uh, you know, exactly. He basically, you know, basically sat down and began to outline how much of the county business was conducted back then. Unfortunately, and uh, you know, mu much of it was conducted in terms of you know, pay to play. And, Right. What was happening was contracts were being let to people who inflated the price exactly. to allow for the bribes that were being paid. Exactly right. And that's uh, our, our, first, uh, our first wave of indictments probably in maybe 80, late 86, early 87 had to do with the janitor contract at the Lake County Government Center for exactly those reasons. Uh, inflated contracts so that money could be built in to kick back to uh, you know the commissioner so having an insider like him to sit down with you and start painting the picture you know obviously uh, enormous importance because then and that this is something I always you know, emphasize to people it's our investigations take time uh, for a number of reasons, m mainly because we dot all our I's and cross all our T's. Uh, but I try to explain to people, you know, it's one thing if somebody tells you A, B, and C. What we then try to do, for example, is go back three or four years and can we reconstruct a paper and financial trail showing A, B, and C? So when we're in a courtroom, it's a lot different case if you have someone saying A, B, and C from the witness stand, and you've got the ability to corroborate that witness through years of financial records, financial transactions, uh, things like that. So that's a lot of what we're doing behind the scenes, uh, including obviously talking to a lot of other potential witnesses who might corroborate a little piece here or a little and piece there. Uh, the, the Kieran indictment was the second wave of the janitor contracts <laughs> because we had done the first wave and then we had to go back for a second wave. But uh, yes, uh, Kieran uh, was involved in the janitor contracts. And that ensnared um, the, the, all three commissioners That's who were commissioners correct. at yep. the time. Rudy, That's yep. Uh, Addison, Stadola, right, and then uh, as it got into the Kieran contracts, then it brought in Corey as well. Yeah, Corey. Yep, yep. 
And then Mike Jankovic was involved in some way, right? Yeah, uh, Jankovic uh, was not involved per se in the janitor contracts, right. but we, uh, Jankovic was, uh, as you know, the longtime Lake County assessor. And basically what Jankovic was doing was, you know, leaning on business people, leaning on property owners for money and or uh, items in exchange for favorable tax treatment. Reduce your, I'll exactly. reduce your taxes exactly. if I get a little of this. Exactly, yeah. exactly. My attitude was always, it never hurts to listen. I am certainly not going to promise you anything up front. I have to see what you have to say, number one. Number two, I need time to attempt to verify what you're telling us. And if those two things are satisfied, then yes, indeed, maybe we can uh, work something out where you would plead, you would cooperate, and then at your sentencing, we would advise the judge of the nature, extent, and value of your cooperation. And I can remember one guy who agreed to cooperate, but ended up not being as valuable as he could have been, which is Peter Benjamin. Uh, yes, yeah, that's correct. And, and you know, and that, that happened uh, a number of times. And again, as I said, uh, we had a lot of people wanting to tell us a lot of things. And uh, number one, what you tell us better be truthful. Number two, I need to confirm it. The East Chicago sidewalk cases. How did that come to your attention? Boy, I, I can't recall exactly how we got on that. It, it was... Might have read it in the paper? The, you know, I think it may have. It may have been uh, one of your article, one of the... the uh, Bill Lazarus? Uh, maybe Bill's article. That's right. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, th thank you. Yes, I believe that's how we got onto it, was from the papers. And uh, Joe, I think, was U.S. attorney then. Uh, and... Uh, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, we, we need to kind of shift gears and start uh, devoting some uh, resources to taking a hard look at this, which we did immediately. So, uh, the Sidewalk <coughs> 6 thing came to your attention. If I remember, Bill Lazarus wrote stories about people complaining that the concrete work stopped the day after election. Uh, it stopped the day after election, or people were complaining because... You know, we, we, and we've used these in some of our public presentations to like Rotary Clubs and things like that. I mean, Gary Bell, who tried that case, uh, Gary just is a great lawyer, uh, a master of organization. You talk about a guy that dots every I and crosses every T, that's Gary Bell. And he's just got some incredible exhibits of you know, blocks in East Chicago, and you know, there'll be six houses in a row with a new sidewalk, and then one house with an old sidewalk, then two more houses with new, then one without, it's incredible. Right. And I mean, what a powerful uh, piece of evidence to put in front of a jury. Right. You know, ladies and gentlemen, how do you explain this? Right. You know. Frankie uh, Colensis, uh, any any disappointments that he, he got away before you could sentence him? Well, yeah, you know, we're always, sure, sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, we, uh, uh, but, you know, he uh, took off, uh, certainly disappointed that we could not yeah. bring that to conclusion. If I yep. remember correctly, Nick Annis did much the same uh, thing. I did the same thing, exactly. Right. So uh, right. Nick Annis and uh, Frank Colensis, correct. Right. Yep. Up to more recent times, of course, we've got uh, Tom Philpott and George Van Til. Right, right. Uh, were those also triggered by uh, news reports, or, or did you have inside people, or do you recall? 
Phil Putt, I can't specifically recall. On the Van Til, uh, we, by, by that point in time, uh, we were starting to get more calls from like county employees, uh, things like that. As you know, in, in many of my public uh, appearances, uh, I'd often be over on WJOB, things like that. Uh, I'd give out my personal phone number and I would urge people, if anybody knows anything, call me personally. You can call the U.S. Attorney personally and, I, and people do that, Bill. And, uh, and sometimes I, it's yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. It's and I, old. I always, uh, what I always do is again, because our role is not to interview uh, witnesses like that, that's the role of the agents. But when people call, I would always call them back as promptly as I could and thank them for their call, find out a little bit about the nature of their call, and then I'd make sure either the FBI or the IRS or somebody got back to them immediately. So as far as you're concerned, that's <clears throat> still a good idea. Right? I think it's still a good idea, absolutely. And uh, I know that, uh, you know, Cliff and uh, uh, Gary and Phil Benson, Dan Bella and that team, uh, they're going to continue with that because uh, information from the public uh, can be very important. And I used to, you know, people would call me sometimes and say, oh, Mr. Cap, I'm sorry to bother you. I said, Ma'am, that's no bother. You know, tell me why you're calling. Well, I, this may not be important, but, and they tell you one little thing. Well, yeah, in and of itself, maybe that's not important. You know that from being a newspaper man. But sometimes that one little thing is a little piece we were missing on a bigger picture. And when we get that one little thing, we go, aha. Uh -huh. I was talking with somebody the other day about all of this corruption, and typically the amount of money is not huge. It's not huge, right? Now that's Personal. that. No, we've 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 talked about that. Yep. Uh, typically, it's not huge. It's not like millions and millions and millions. No, no it's not. It's usually uh, uh, small amounts, and you you kind of wonder why. Yeah, yeah. I, and that was my, my, yeah. my next yeah. question. Yeah, and I don't have a, I don't, don't have a good answer they for would it. Sell their office yeah. for, so cheaply. I don't have an answer for that. No. no. Okay. Yeah. Is there any one thing you can say about all the people that you've you've convicted successfully, uh, the public corruption side of it, uh, that was in common that they all did. The, the one golden rule that I suppose you could tell future uh, officials don't do, is there, is there any one thing where they all fell down in the same way? Or? I, I think it's, yeah, that's a good question. And I, I think it's, it's attitudinal. It, I, I think the common element they all shared is they thought the office was theirs. They really did. And it's not. The office is ours. It's the public's. And if there's one, that's a good question. If there's one element that all of them had, it was truly they thought the office was theirs. Yeah. You know, and uh, that was, that in my mind is what ultimately brought all of them down. They all came down a different way, different subject matters, different amounts of money, different techniques, but at the core, that's what I think brought them all down, Bill, is just this thinking that the office was theirs. In the last uh, four or five years with what we've been doing in our gang initiative, uh, I think we've been 80 or more yeah. uh, uh, of the Latin Kings and the Imperial Gangsters uh, specifically. In the process of putting together those indictments, we've probably solved uh, 40 unsolved homicides in uh, the region. Uh, these guys are guys who uh, are dangerous, 
and I think the difference maker that we bring to these cases in the federal system is our ability to hold these guys without bond. I think that's the difference maker. Uh, when we get you, you're done. And that sends to me two powerful messages. One, it sends a message to the bad guys that if we get you, you're done. But more important, it sends a message to the good guys that these guys are not going to be back in your neighborhood committing more crimes. They're not going to be back in your neighborhood uh, 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 intimidating witnesses, things like that. I, I think that second message is the powerful message to the good guys. And I'm, I'm confident that uh, that initiative will continue. In fact, uh, the, uh, I, I left office on uh, Friday, uh, March 10th. Uh, that Tuesday or Wednesday of that week, we had had our first uh, uh, U.S. Attorney Conference call with the Attorney General Sessions. And uh, it was a brief call, but the, the Attorney General made it clear that he wanted to see federal resources being focused on this violent street crime, which of course is something we've been doing all along. So, <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I had just uh, I had just come back because the week prior we had done our first racketeering indictment against street violence in Fort Wayne. So I had been over in Fort Wayne uh, just the week before announcing our first use of the uh, racketeering statutes against uh, gangs in Fort Wayne. So I think you're going to continue to see that uh, in the U.S. Attorney's Office. And one last disclaimer, and that is I uh, certainly, you know, cannot speak to any pending matters and uh, nothing I say is uh, uh, a reflection on any of those pending matters. All pending matters, the persons are presumed innocent and that presumption remains unless and until they are ultimately convicted in court. And that's a very important uh, point and it's a point that uh, we try to uh, adhere to not only in the letter but in the spirit as well at the U.S. Attorney's Office. People ask me about, you know, what cases and what have you I'm most proud of. And to tell you the truth, what I'm most proud of is not any particular case or any particular subject matter. What I'm most proud of is I had the ability to be part of putting that team together at the U.S. Attorney's Office. And uh, it's a great team. And the fact that I'm now gone is not going to change anything over there. They're going to keep going.